Hello, and welcome to Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, the podcast. Written by Eliezer Yudkowsky, read by Ineash Brodsky, based on the works of J.K. Rowling. Hi all. I wanted to thank everyone for the huge turnout in Voldemort auditions. I have now found my Voldemort voice actor, so I don't need any more submissions. Thank you to everyone who reached out to help me with this. Chapter 106 The Truth Part 3 After a single step into Dumbledore's forbidden chamber, Harry shrieked and jumped back and collided with Professor Snape, sending the two of them down in a heap. Professor Snape picked himself up and resumed standing in front of the door. His head tracked to look at Harry. I am guarding this door at the headmaster's orders. Be off with you at once, or I shall deduct house points. This was bone-chillingly creepy but Harry's attention was occupied by the gigantic three-headed dog which had lunged forward, only to be stopped meters from Harry by the chains upon its three collars. That! 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 Yes, Professor Quirrell said from a ways behind him. That is indeed the usual occupant of that chamber, which is off-limits to all students. Especially first years. That's not safe even by wizard standards! Within the chamber, the enormous black beast gave a multi-voiced bellow, flecks of white saliva flying from three fanged mouths. Professor Quirrell sighed. <sighs> it is enchanted not to eat students. Just spit them back out through the door. Now, boy, how would you recommend that we deal with this dangerous creature? Um... Harry stuttered, trying to think over the continued roaring of the chamber's guardian. Uh, if it's like the Cerberus from the Muggle legend of Orpheus and Eurydice, then we have to sing it to sleep so we can pass... Avada Kedavra. The three-headed beast fell over. Harry looked back at Professor Quirrell, who was giving him a look of extreme disappointment, as if to ask whether Harry had attended any of his classes ever. I sort of assumed that going through this challenge in any way except the one used by first years might perhaps trigger an alarm. That is a lie, boy. You simply did not remember your lessons when you faced the occasion in true life. As for alarms, I have spent months befuddling all the wards and trip signs upon these chambers. Then why did you send me in first, exactly? Professor Quirrell just smiled. It looked significantly more evil than usual. Never mind, Harry said, and walked slowly into the chamber, his limbs still shaking. The chamber was all of stone, illuminated by a pale blue light that shone from arched nooks carved into the walls, as if the light of a gray sky were passing through windows, though there were no windows. At the far end of the chamber was a wooden trap door upon the floor with a single ring attached. In the middle of the chamber lay a gigantic dead dog with three lifeless heads. Harry turned toward one of the arched nooks and looked inside. There was nothing there but the sourceless blue glow, so he walked over and looked in the next one, also scrutinizing the wall as he passed. What are you doing? Searching the room. There could be a clue, or an inscription, or a key we'll need later, or something. Are you serious, or are you deliberately trying to slow us down? Answer in parcel tongue. Harry looked back. Was serious. Would have done the same if came by myself. Professor Quirrell briefly massaged his forehead. I confess that your approach would serve you well in... Say, exploring the tomb of Amon Set, so I will not quite call you an idiot. But still, the false puzzle, the outer form of the challenge, is a game meant for first years. We simply go down through the trap door. Beneath the trap door was a gigantic plant, something like an enormous Diefenbachia with wide leaves emerging from the central stem like a spiral staircase but darker colored than a normal Diefenbachia, with tendril-like vines emerging from the central stem and hanging down. 
the base spread out wide with bigger leaves and tendrils, as though promising to cushion anyone's fall. Beneath was another stone chamber like the first, with the same nooks like false arched windows emitting the same gray-blue light. The obvious thought is to fly down on the broomstick in my pouch or toss something heavy to see if those tendrils are traps, Harry said, peering down. But I'm guessing you'll say that we just walk down the leaves. They certainly looked like they were meant to be a spiral staircase. After you. Harry carefully put a foot down on a leaf and found that it indeed supported his weight. Then Harry took a last look around the room before departing to see if there was anything worth noticing. The enormous dead dog called enough attention to itself that it was hard to focus on anything else. Professor Quirrell, Harry said, omitting the phrase, your approach to dealing with obstacles has certain drawbacks. What if someone looks in the door and sees that the Cerberus is dead? Then they have probably already noticed something wrong with Snape. But since you insist... The defense professor walked over to the three-headed corpse and placed his wand against it. He began a Latin-sounding incantation that was accompanied by a sense of rising apprehension, the boy who lived feeling the Dark Lord's power as he always had. The last spoken word was, Inferius, and it was accompanied by a final surge of, Stop! Don't! And the three-headed dog rose to a stand, its six eyes dull and blank, turning to watch the door once more. Harry stared at the huge Inferius with a horrible sinking sensation in his stomach, the third worst feeling he'd ever felt in his life. He knew then that he'd seen and sensed this procedure before, only without the spoken Latin. The centaur who'd confronted him in the Forbidden Forest was dead. The defense professor had hit it with a real Avada Kedavra, not a fake one. Somewhere in the back of his mind, Harry had thought that if he could just get Hermione back, then he could return to the code of nobody dying, the ethic of Batman. Most people went through their whole lives without anyone getting killed on whatever adventures they had. And that was not to be. He hadn't even noticed the day he lost his last chance to win. Even if Hermione was resurrected, now Harry wouldn't have come through the whole mess without anyone getting killed. He hadn't even learned the centaur's name. Harry said nothing aloud. The defense professor would either confirm the accusation in parcel tongue or lie in plain speech. And either way, the defense professor would have more reason to suspect Harry's next actions. But Harry knew that. Although he didn't know how he would stop Professor Quirrell, although he didn't dare any positive act of betrayal, maybe not even making the decision until it was almost time to win, there would never be an amical settlement between him and Lord Voldemort. For those two different spirits could not exist in the same world. And it was like that resolution, that knowledge of opposition, invoked a strength from what Harry had thought of as his dark side. Harry had stopped trying to deliberately call on his dark side after the day he'd killed the troll. But his dark side had never been something separate from him. It had been something remembered from Tom Riddle. Harry didn't know how that had happened, but taking the assumption and running with it... Whatever echoes of cognitive skill were in his dark side should be there for him to use. Not as a separate mode, as Harry had conceptualized it at first, but just as neural patterns with a strong tendency to chain into one another, since they had once formed part of a connected whole. This, unfortunately, did not change the fact that Professor Quirrell had the same skills with far more life experience backing them up, and also had the gun. Harry turned and set foot on the giant plant and began to walk down the spiral staircase provided by the leaves. It had taken Harry too long this time, but he'd recovered himself to some degree, despite the grief still weighing him down like thick water. It wasn't a cold steel rod in his spine, but it was something straight and solid nonetheless. He was going to play this through. See Hermione return to life first, and then, somehow, stop Professor Quirrell. 
or stop Professor Quirrell first and then get the stone himself. There had to be something, some possibility, some opportunity that would present itself, some way to stop Voldemort and return Hermione to life. Harry continued his descent. Behind him, the three-headed dog waited, guarding the gate. End Chapter 106 Chapter 107 The Truth, Part 4 The spiraling leaves of the gigantic Dyfenbachia felt like forest loam beneath Harry's shoes, not as unyielding as concrete, but supporting his weight. Harry kept a wary eye on the tendrils, but they remained passive. When Harry reached the bottom of the leafy spiral staircase, the tendrils suddenly whipped out and grasped Harry's arms and legs. After a brief struggle, Harry allowed himself to go limp. Interesting said Professor Quirrell as he floated down from above, not touching any of the plant's leaves or tendrils. I notice that you seem to have no trouble losing to a plant. Harry looked more closely at the defense professor, seeing him now without the lens of panic. Professor Quirrell was upright and moving, flying without apparent difficulty. The sense of doom about him was strong. But his eyes were still sunken in the skull, his arms thin and wasted. The sickness had not been bluff, and the obvious hypothesis was that the defense professor had recently eaten another unicorn to temporarily regain some strength. And the defense professor was also speaking like the mask of Professor Quirrell, not like Lord Voldemort, which might not be a bad thing from Harry's perspective. Harry didn't know why, unless it was that the defense professor still needed him for something, but it certainly seemed to be in Harry's own interests to play along. You specifically let me walk into this trap, Professor, Harry answered, just the way he'd have spoken to Professor Quirrell. Rolls, masks, remind him of how it was between us. On my own, I'd have used my broomstick. Perhaps. How would an ordinary first year solve this challenge? If they had their wand, that is. The plant was now reaching tendrils out toward Professor Quirrell, but Professor Quirrell was hovering just out of their reach. Harry had now remembered Professor Sprout talking about a devil's snare plant, which the herbology textbook had said liked cool, dark places like caves, though how that could be true of a leafy plant was anyone's guess. At a guess, I'd say this is a devil's snare plant and it might retreat from light or heat, so maybe a first year could use Lumos? Today, I'd use Inflammare, but I didn't learn that spell until May. A twirl of the defense professor's wand and a pattern of sprays of liquid shot out from it, striking the plant near the bases of its tendrils, hitting with a quiet splat and then a quiet hissing. All the tendrils touching Harry frantically shot back and began to beat at the growing wounds appearing on the plant's skin, as if trying to remove the pain stimulus. Something about the plant gave the impression that it was screaming soundlessly. Professor Quirrell finished drifting downward. Now it is afraid of light, heat, acid, and me. Harry stepped off the final leaves onto the floor after a careful glance at his robes and then the floor to make sure that none of the acid had splashed anywhere. Harry had begun to suspect that Professor Quirrell was trying to make some sort of point, but Harry did not know what that point might be. I thought we were on a mission, Professor. I can't stop you, but is it smart to spend this much time on messing with me? Oh, we have time. There would be a great uproar if we were discovered here, guarded by Ninfarius. You did not act like you had heard of such an uproar at your Quidditch match before you arrived in this time and spoke to Snape as you did. A slight chill came over Harry as he comprehended this. Anything he did to beat Professor Quirrell would have to not disrupt the school, or at least the Quidditch game, because it hadn't disrupted the Quidditch game. Even if enough forces could be called in to subdue Lord Voldemort, it might not be easy to do it without Professor McGonagall or Professor Flitwick or anyone else at the Quidditch game noticing. Fighting a smart enemy was hard. And even so, 
Even so, it seemed to Harry that if he stood in Professor Quirrell's shoes, he would not be having leisurely conversations and playing mind games. Professor Quirrell was gaining something by taking his time here. But what? Was there some other process that had to run to completion? By the by, have you betrayed me yet? Have not betrayed you yet. The defense professor gestured pointedly with the gun he was now holding in his left hand, and Harry walked ahead to the great wooden door at the end of the room and opened it. The next chamber was smaller in diameter, with a higher ceiling. The light shining out of the arched alcoves was white instead of blue. Around them whizzed hundreds of winged keys, beating frantically through the air. After watching for a few seconds, it became clear that only a single key was the golden color of a snitch, though it was moving slower than a snitch in a real Quidditch game. On the other end of the room was a door containing a large, prominent keyhole. Against the left wall leaned a broomstick, the school's workhorse Clean Sweep 7. Professor, Harry said, staring up at the clouds and flocks of whizzing keys. You said you would answer my questions. What exactly is all this about? If you think you've secured a door so that it won't open without a key, you keep the key in a safe place and only give a copy to authorized entrance. You don't give the key wings and then leave a broomstick propped against the wall. So what the heck are we doing in here and what is going on? It's an obvious guess that the magic mirror is the only real factor guarding the stone, but why the rest of this? And why encourage first years to come here? I am not truly sure. The defense professor had entered the room and taken up station well to Harry's right, maintaining the distance between them. But I shall answer as I said I would. Dumbledore's way is to do a dozen things which seem mad, and then only eight of them, or perhaps nine, conceal an inner meaning. My guess is that Dumbledore intends to make it seem like I am invited to send a student as my proxy, precisely so that Lord Voldemort, as Dumbledore conceives of him, is less tempted to think himself clever by doing so. Imagine Dumbledore first considering the issue of how to ward the stone. Imagine Dumbledore considering whether to set true dangers to guard the mirror. Imagine him imagining some young student blundering through those dangers at my behest. I think that is what Dumbledore is trying to avoid, by making it seem as though that strategy is invited, and so not cunning. Unless, of course, I have misunderstood what Dumbledore thinks Lord Voldemort will think. Professor Quirrell grinned, and it looked just as natural, on him, as any grin he'd shown Harry before. Plotting does not come naturally to Dumbledore, but he tries because he must. To that task, Dumbledore brings intelligence, dedication, the ability to learn from his mistakes, and an utter lack of native talent. He is marvelously hard to predict for that reason alone. Harry looked away, looking at the door on the opposite side of the room. It wasn't a game to him, Professor. My guess is that the intended solution for first years is to ignore the broomstick and use Wingardium Leviosa to grab the key, since this isn't a Quidditch game and there are no rules forbidding that. So what absurdly overpowered spell are you going to unleash on this one, then? There was a brief silence, but for the whizzing of keys. Harry took several steps away from Professor Quirrell. I probably shouldn't have said that, should I? Oh no, I think that is a quite reasonable thing to say to the most powerful dark wizard in the world when he is standing not a dozen paces from you. Professor Quirrell put his wand back into the sleeve of his other hand, the hand that sometimes held the gun. Then the defense professor reached into his mouth and took out what appeared to be a tooth. He tossed the false tooth high in the air, and when it came down, it had transformed into a wand that sparked a strange sense of recognition in Harry's mind, as though some part of him recognized the wand as being... part of him. Thirteen and a half inches, 
you with a core of phoenix feather. Harry had memorized the information when the wand maker Alla something had given it, because it had seemed like it might be plot relevant. The event, and the thinking that had underlain it, both felt a lifetime distant. The defense professor raised that wand and traced in the air a flaming rune that was all jagged edges and malevolence. Harry took another instinctive step back. Then Professor Quirrell spoke. Azreth. 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 The flaming rune began pouring out fire that was twisted, as though the jagged edges of the rune had become the nature of the fire itself. The fire was blazing crimson, shaded further red than blood, glowing as searingly intense as an arc welder. That brilliance in that shade seemed wrong in its own right, like nothing shaded so far red should give off that much light. And the searing crimson was shot through with veins of black that seemed to suck the light from the fire. Within that blackened fire, outlined in the interplay of crimson and darkness, animal shapes twisted wildly from one predator to another, cobra to hyena to scorpion. Azreth, Azreth, Azreth. When Professor Quirrell had repeated the word six times, as much black crimson fire had poured out of the volume as a small bush. The cursed fire slowed in its changes as Professor Quirrell locked eyes upon it, taking on a single form, the form of a blackened, blood-burning phoenix. And something told Harry with a terrible certainty that if that blackened, burning phoenix met Fox, the true phoenix would die and never be reborn. Professor Quirrell made a single gesture with his wand, and the blackened fire went soaring across the room. It met the door and its keyhole, and with a single sweep of crimson burning wings, most of the door and part of the archway was consumed. Then the tainted crimson blaze swept on. Harry had only a glance through the hole to see huge statues just beginning to raise swords and clubs when the blackened fire came among them, and they cracked and burned. When it ended, the blackened fire phoenix swept back in through the hole and hovered above Professor Quirrell's left shoulder, the sun-intense crimson claws staying an inch from his robes. Go on ahead. It's safe now. Harry walked forward, needing to invoke his dark side's cognitive patterns in order to maintain calm enough to do it. Harry stepped over the glowing edges of the remaining part of the door and gazed at a chessboard of ruined, huge chess pieces. The alternating tiles of black and white marble on the floor started five meters after the ruined doorway and extended from wall to wall, but stopped five meters short of the next door on the opposite side of the room. The ceiling was significantly higher than any of the statues should have been able to reach. I would guess and Harry's dark side cognitive patterns kept his voice calm, that the intended solution is to fly over the statues using the broomstick from the previous room, since it wasn't actually needed to get the key. From behind, Professor Quirrell laughed, and it was Lord Voldemort's laugh. Proceed, said a voice grown colder and higher. Go to the next room. I wish to see what you will make of what is there. Arranged by Dumbledore for first years, Harry reminded himself. It will be safe. And he walked across the ruined chessboard, laid his hand upon that door's handle, and pushed it inward. (laughs) Half a second later, Harry slammed the door and leapt back. It took Harry several seconds to master his breathing and master himself. From behind the door came continued loud bellows and great slams as of a rock club pounding the floor. I suppose, Harry said in a voice grown cold as well, that since Dumbledore would hardly put a real mountain troll in there, the next challenge is an illusion of my worst memories, like a Dementor with the memory projected into the outside world. Very amusing, Professor. Professor Quirrell advanced himself toward the door, and Harry stepped well aside. 
besides the sense of doom that was now strong about the professor, Harry's dark side, or just plain instinct, was advising him not to get anywhere near that black crimson fire hovering above Professor Quirrell's shoulder. Professor Quirrell swung open the door and looked in. Hmm, just the troll, as you say. Ah, well, I had hoped to learn something about you more interesting than that. What lies within is a Kokor Hekas, also known as the Common Bogart. A Bogart? What does that... No, I suppose I know what it does. Professor Quirrell's voice was now again that of a Hogwarts professor lecturing. A Bogart gravitates to dark enclosures that are rarely opened, such as a neglected cupboard in the attic. It seeks to be left alone, and it will manifest in whatever form it thinks will scare you away. Scare me away? I killed the troll! You leapt backward out of the room without thinking. A Bogart seeks out the instinctive flinch, not the reasoned threat. Else it would have selected something more believable. In any case, the standard counter charm for a Bogart is, of course, fiend fire. Professor Quirrell gestured, and the blackened fire leapt off his shoulder and poured through the doorway. From within the room, there was a single squeak, and then nothing. They advanced into the Bogart's former room, Professor Quirrell going first this time. With the seeming mountain troll gone, the room was just another huge chamber lit by scones of cold blue light. Professor Quirrell's gaze seemed distant, thoughtful. He crossed the room without waiting for Harry and swung open the door on the opposite wall of his own accord. Harry followed after, and not closely. The next chamber contained a cauldron, a rack of bottled ingredients, chopping boards, stirring sticks, and the other apparatus of potions. The light coming from the arched alcoves was white instead of blue, presumably because color vision was important to potions brewing. Professor Quirrell was already standing next to the brewing apparatus, scrutinizing a long parchment he had picked up. The door to the next chamber was guarded by a curtain of purple fire that would have looked a lot more threatening if it hadn't seemed pale and weak by comparison to the blackened flame hovering over Professor Quirrell's shoulder. Harry's suspension of disbelief had already checked out on vacation at this point, so he didn't say anything about how real-world security systems had the goal of distinguishing authorized from unauthorized personnel, which meant issuing challenges that behaved differently around people who were or weren't supposed to be there. For example, a good security challenge would be testing whether the entrant knew a lock combination that only authorized people had been told and a bad security challenge would be testing whether the entrant could brew a potion according to written instructions that had been helpfully included. Professor Quirrell tossed the parchment toward Harry, and it fluttered to the ground between them. What do you make of this? And Professor Quirrell then stepped back so that Harry could come forward and pick up the parchment. Nope, Harry said after skimming the parchment. Testing whether the entrant can solve a ridiculously straightforward logic puzzle about the order of the ingredients is still not a challenge that behaves differently for authorized and unauthorized personnel. It doesn't matter if you use a more interesting logic puzzle about three idols or a line of people wearing colored hats. You're still completely missing the point. Look at the other side. Harry turned over the two-foot parchment. On the other side, written in tiny letters, was the longest list of brewing instructions Harry had ever seen. What on earth? A potion of effulgence to quench the purple fire. It is made by adding the same ingredients over and over again in slightly different ways. Imagine some eager young group of first years passing all the other chambers thinking they are just about to reach the magic mirror and then encountering this task. This room is the handiwork of the potions master indeed. Harry glanced pointedly at the black fire shape on Professor Quirrell's shoulder. Fire can't beat fire? It can. I am not sure it should. Suppose this room is trapped. Harry did not want to be stuck brewing this potion for laughs. 
or for whatever other reason Professor Curl was taking them through these chambers so slowly. The potion's recipe had 35 separate occasions for adding bellflowers, 14 times to add a lock of bright hair. Maybe the potion gives off a lethal gas that is fatal to adult wizards but not children, or any of a hundred other deadly tricks if we're suddenly being serious. Are we being serious? This room is the handiwork of Severus Snape. Once more, Professor Quirrell looked thoughtful. Snape is not a bystander in this game, not quite. He lacks Dumbledore's intelligence, but he possesses the killing intent that Dumbledore never had. Well, whatever's going on here, it doesn't actually keep out children. Lots of first years made it through. And if you can somehow keep out everyone except children, then that, from Dumbledore's perspective, forces Lord Voldemort to possess a child to enter. I don't see the point, given their goals. Indeed. Professor Quirrell rubbed the bridge of his nose. But see, boy, this room lacks the triggers and trip signs that are upon the others. There are no subtle wards to be defeated. It is as if I am invited to bypass the potion and simply enter. But Snape knows that Lord Voldemort will perceive this. If, in fact, there was a trap laid for anyone who did not brew the potion, then it would be wiser to lay wards and give no sign that this room was different from the others. Harry listened, frowning in concentration. So, the only point of leaving off the detection webs is to make you not bulldoze this room? I expect Snape expects me to deduce that as well. And past that point, I cannot predict at what level he thinks I will play. I am patient, and I have given myself plenty of time for this endeavor. But Snape does not know me. He only knows Lord Voldemort. He has sometimes seen Lord Voldemort shriek in frustration and act on impulses that appear counterproductive. Consider this matter from Snape's perspective. It is the Potions Master of Hogwarts telling Lord Voldemort to be patient and follow instructions if he wants to enter, as though Lord Voldemort were a mere schoolboy. I would find it easy to comply, smiling the while, and take my vengeance later. But Snape does not know that Lord Voldemort finds it easy to think this way. Professor Quirrell looked at Harry. Boy... You saw me floating in the air by the devil's snare, did you not? Harry nodded. Then he noticed his confusion. My charms textbook says it's impossible for wizards to levitate themselves. Yes, that is what it says in your charms textbook. No wizard may levitate themselves or any object supporting their own weight. It is like trying to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. Yet Lord Voldemort alone can fly. How? Answer as quickly as you can. If the question was answerable by a first-year student... You had someone else cast broomstick enchantments on your underwear, then you obliviated them. Not quite. The broomstick enchantments require a long, narrow shape, which must be solid. Cloth will not do. Harry's eyebrows furrowed. How long does the shape have to be? Can you attach some short broomstick rods to a fabric harness and fly using those? Indeed. At first, I strapped enchanted rods to my arms and legs, but that was only to teach myself a new mode of flight. Professor Quirrell drew back the sleeve of his robes, revealing the bare arm. As you can see, I have nothing up my sleeve right now. Harry absorbed this further constraint. You had someone cast broomstick enchantments on your bones? Professor Quirrell sighed. (sighs) And that was one of Voldemort's most feared feats, or so I am told. After all these years, and some amount of reluctant legitimacy, I still do not truly comprehend what is wrong with ordinary people. But you are not one of them. It is time for you to begin contributing to this expedition. You have known Severus Snape more recently than I. Tell me your own analysis of this room. Harry hesitated, trying to look thoughtful. 
I will mention, said Professor Quirrell, as the blackened fire phoenix on his shoulder seemed to extend its head and glare at Harry, that if you knowingly allow me to fail, I will call it betrayal. I remind you that the stone is key to Miss Granger's resurrection, and that I hold hostage the lives of hundreds of students. I remember. And on the heels of this, Harry's wonderful inventive brain came up with a thought. Harry wasn't sure he should say it. The silence stretched. Have you thought of anything yet? Answer in parcel tongue. No, this was not going to be easy, not against a smart opponent who could force you to tell the literal truth at any time. Severus, at least the modern-day Severus, respects your intelligence a great deal. I think he might expect Lord Voldemort to believe that Severus wouldn't believe that Voldemort could pass his test of patience. But Severus would expect Voldemort to pass it. Professor Quirrell nodded. That is a plausible theory. Do you believe it yourself? Answer in parcel tongue. Yes. It might not be safe to withhold information, not even thoughts and ideas. Therefore, the point of this room is to delay Lord Voldemort for an hour. If I wanted to kill you, believing what Dumbledore believes, the obvious thing to try would be a Dementor's kiss. I mean, they think you're a disembodied soul. Are you, by the way? Professor Quirrell was still. Dumbledore would not think of that method. But Severus might. Professor Quirrell began to tap a finger against his cheek, his gaze distant. You have power over Dementors, boy. Can you tell me if there are any nearby? Harry closed his eyes. If there were voids in the world, he could not feel them. None that I can sense. Answer in parcel tongue. Do not sense life eaters. But you were being honest with me when you suggested the possibility. You intended no clever trickery. Was honest. Not trick. Perhaps there is some means by which Dementors might be concealed, being told to leap out and eat a possessing soul if they see one. Professor Quirrell was still tapping his cheek. It is not impossible that I would qualify. Or it can be told to eat anyone who passes through this room too quickly, or anyone who is not a child. Bearing in mind that I hold Hermione and hundreds of other students hostage over you, would you use your power over Dementors to defend me if a Dementor unmasked itself? Answer in parcel tongue. Don't know. Life eaters cannot destroy me, I think. And I will simply abandon this body if they approach too close shall return swiftly this time, and then there will be no stopping me. We'll torture your parents for years to punish you for balking me. Hundreds of hostage students die, including those you call friends. Now I ask again, will you use power over life eaters to protect me if life eaters come? Yes. The sadness and horror that Harry had pushed down flared up again, and his dark side had no stored patterns for handling the emotions. Why, Professor Quirrell? Why are you like this? Professor Quirrell smiled. That reminds me. Have you betrayed me yet? Have not betrayed you yet. Professor Quirrell went over to the potion's equipment and began chopping a root one-handed, the knife moving almost invisibly fast and with no apparent effort. The fiendfire phoenix drifted over to the opposite corner of the room and waited there. All matters considered in their uncertainty, it seems wiser to expend the time to pass this room as a first year would. We may as well talk while we are waiting. You had questions, boy? I said that I would answer them, so ask. End chapter 107 If you enjoyed this episode and haven't done so yet, please consider leaving a rating or review at iTunes. 
This chapter's original text, production notes, and attribution links, along with archives and much more, can be found at hpmorpodcast.com. If you would like to learn more about the art of rationality, please visit lesswrong.com, an online community of aspiring rationalists founded by Eliezer Yudkowsky. Some sound effects used are courtesy of the Free Sound Project. The music used is The Fall by Ministry. Thank you for listening, and come back in two weeks for the first part of Chapter 108, The Truth, Part 5, Answers and Riddles. Yeah.